for this next session that's called Professionalization of Cooperative Boards, the Canary in the Coal Mine, question mark. And this is being, this has been orchestrated by three people to use 30 minutes in a, I suspect, very creative way. So I'll be handing it over to Marc-Andre, Dion, and Anthony. They'll do their formal introductions of themselves. Following their 30-minute piece, we then have Sheldon Stenner on the line, who's from Federated Cooperatives Limited, one of the largest cooperatives in Canada. And Sheldon's an expert in all things governance and co-op, so we'll be uh, giving Sheldon a chance to, to have his summary con uh, comments following the presentation. So Marc-Andre, Dion, and Anthony, over to you. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, I assume you can see my slides and everything's fine? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm going to briefly introduce the team here. We're, we're, as Karen said, we're collaborating to present uh, basically three presentations in 30 minutes. It'll be a, a challenge. Uh, I'm from the University of Saskatchewan. Um, Anthony's from Conestega College, and Dion is from the University of Toronto, and Karen just introduced, introduced Sheldon. So that's that's our introductions, and we're going to charge into the presentation. Um, so we, Karen's read the title of our, our talk here today. Um, it's really centered on this professionalization theme, and the, the interest in this issue emerged uh, because of a few events that have happened in Canada over the last few months uh, and years. The most recent Kind of dramatic event being the mountain equipment co-op uh, and that what was effectively a demutualization or a, 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 a conversion of that that uh, cooperative into an investor-owned firm uh, the other recent event or relatively recent event was the decision by calgary co-op uh, to to stop purchasing uh, groceries from the retail wholesale that they, they collectively own with a couple hundred or roughly 180 other retail cooperatives in Western Canada. Uh, so that was a big, big decision, big sh shock to the cooperative system in Canada. Uh, and then the other one that Anthony is going to talk about is the demutualization of a, of a pretty large um, mutual insurance company called Economical. Um, so these, these events we think are all, there's a thread that ties these together. And we think that professionalization of the board is, is, is that thread that kind of shows some, there's some kind of causality that may be going on here. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we want to go with this talk is kind of explore that idea of, of the relationship between professionalization and ultimately this conversion. Um, so what do we mean by professionalization? So this is, I think, you know, we talk a lot about it. This has been a big topic of uh, discourse in Canada since the M Mountain Equipment Co-op, uh, let's call it uh, conversion. Uh, and, and I think often we don't really take a minute to define the term. So here's what the Oxford Dictionary says about professionalization. It's relating to or belong to a profession. Okay, so that's pretty intuitive. Um, it's relating to or around one's main paid occupation. Again, that's, that's probably what we all understood from the term. Uh, as it's used conventionally. Uh, but the third definition I think is, is kind of useful for us. Um, it talks about someone whose uh, behavior is appropriate to a professional person. So not necessarily a professional, but someone who is competent, skillful, and assured. So that's an interesting uh, kind of twist on professionalization. I think it provides us a way to reframe some of this debate in a more productive way. And I'll, I'll give you some, uh, we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. But right now I wanna show you some, some evidence that, that things are, the things that we've seen with Mountain Equipment Co-op and Economical and, and even Calgary Co-op um, are, are part of a, a broader, maybe a little worrying trend. Uh, so they're not just isolated to these really dramatic examples, but there's something more general going on. So um, this is some data I'm gonna share with you from a survey that we did at the Canadian Center uh, for the study of cooperatives around governance practices. This is really structural governance features. We're not, we didn't have time or energy or money to do qualitative kind of conversational uh, surveys, but this is, this is really just getting at some of the structural features that governance um, co cooperatives have in their governance practices across Canada. Um, we have about 83 respondents um, in our survey, and we're going to be building out more tools and expanding that hopefully in the future. But uh, for now, that's that's our response rate. Um, and you know, as you know, there's probably there's several hundred, if not thousands, of cooperatives. So we can we can do a lot better. Um, but if you look at this question that we asked around having non-member directors on your board, so 90% of the respondents say we don't. We don't have non-members. Uh, but close to 10% say we do. You know, so that's a that's what that's eight or eight or so cooperative slash credit unions. 
that have a non-member director on their board. And this is a this is probably a, a, an early indicator again of this this kind of professionalism kind of thought that's that's percolating through the cooperative and credit union system in Canada. Um, so there's some evidence that's happening. I should say this is probably, and we'd have to dig a little more into this. This a lot of this is coming from the credit union sector, um, and I'll come back to that that point in a minute. Um, the other thing that kind of the other indicator of professionalizing your board could be uh, the CEO on the board. So this is something that might strike you as very odd, but um, we thought we would ask because um, this is something people are talking about increasingly. And in our survey, only one cooperative had their CEO on the board. And I can tell you who that is because it's well known and it's public knowledge. Um, it's Desjardins. Desjardins CEO is on the board of their organization uh, and has been for a very long time. Uh, but, but, and I'll tell you, I'll show you some evidence of this um, in a minute. There's, there's syndications that this could be uh, a trend that's starting, that could be starting to build. And I'll, show, I'll explain why in a second. Um, so that's, that's another bit of a worrying sign, although not from the data yet, but likely in the near future. Um, and then if we look at who, who, when we ask respondents, who's, who's influencing election results? Who's got the kind of most influence on election results? Um, and if you look at the most important and second most important categories, the dark blue box or segment of the, the bar graph um, is membership. And that's what you would expect. So roughly 64% of, of you know, people chose these as the uh, uh, membership as the most important or second most important um, just determinants of, of uh, uh, election outcomes. But look at the, look at the uh, lighter blue at the bottom here, the board as a whole. Um, the board from the survey respondents is ex exerting a lot of influence on who gets on the board. So 25% uh, in the most important and 40% in the second most important. And look at the third most important, 32%. Um, if you add those up, uh, the board is exerting a lot of influence on who gets on the board, much less so than the membership across those three categories. Um, so this, this could be a bit of a worrying sign as well. Um, you, you might expect from a kind of more traditional cooperative perspective, that the membership should really be driving the bus here, but it looks like, um, looks like the board is exerting some considerable influence. Um, now, this might not be too worrying, except that if we look at the credit union space in particular, and I just want to say the credit union space is influential because not only are there are they lenders to the rest of the cooperative system sometimes, um, but their board members are often board members on other cooperatives too. So there's this kind of, uh, you know, there's this kind of cross fertilization of thinking that happens from one to the other, one area of cooperative sector to the other. Um, and if you look at the, the regulatory context, just gonna link back to some of what Hans was just saying. I mean, you look at what's happening in the regulatory context, there are tremendous pressures being put on cooperative, on credit unions to professionalize their board. What I'm showing you here are two quotes, one from the federal bank regulator, which regulates largely banks, so very few credit unions, only, only two so far, uh, but more on the way, so this is important to note. Um, but the point that they're stressing, the federal bank regulators, we don't want people to train up when they're on the board. They have to come onto the board with expertise already. They have to be lawyers, accountants, you know, professional finance people, risk managers, marketing people. They have to come in with IT experience or whatever, but they have to be skilled professionals who are in that occupation. They don't want to see training. That's not what they're looking for. And then if you look at the provincial level where most credit unions are regulated in Canada still, the vast majority. Look at this regulatory uh, citation here from Saskatchewan, probably one of the outside of Quebec province with the kind of strongest credit union sector um, in Canada. And you see the words are identical, copied word for word from the federal bank um, regulator. So I think of this as they're trying to, this is a kind of what I would call policy isomorphism, where they're copying what the bank regulator is doing and bringing that into the credit union sector. Uh, and they're underlining that really they're, they're not too interested in training. Oh, they'll tolerate it, but they're moving in this direction of bringing on people who already have skills, uh, that first and second definition. If you drill down a little more into the provincial regulator and how they're thinking about go governance, um, they talk about actively recruiting candidates with the necessary skills. Think back to that evidence we just showed you a moment ago where the board seems to be exerting a lot of influence on, on election outcomes. Some of this could be coming from the, from, from the regulator. Some of that pressure could be coming from the regulator. Um, the provincial regulator allows for the idea that you can pursue educational opportunities. 
Um, but look, they're focusing on corporate and risk governance practice. Those are important, absolutely. I've worked in the credit union sector. You can't ignore these things. Uh, but there's no emphasis, no discussion, no importance given to cooperative perspective, cooperative background, cooperative experience. It's all about the skills. Um, and then this is the kicker here. Look at the third one. I just underlined the key bit. Appointment of non-members to the board, if necessary. Again, underlining this kind of professionalization trend coming from the policymaking perspective. Coax, my translation of this is co-op experience is not important. Delegated democratic systems are not helpful and probably not very well tolerated and professionals are needed. That's the message that's being directed by the policymaking community here. Um, one more thing to note, and then I'm gonna hand it off to Anthony. Um, Ontario recently passed a legislative change that allows credit unions to point their, their CEO to the board if they make bylaw changes. Again, nice linkage back to Hans' talk here, but the point is that the, the door has been opened. And the door has been opened because some credit unions have created bank subsidiaries. And when you have a bank subsidiary, you become regulated federally. And when you become regulated federally, you're required to have your CEO on the board of the bank. So the, the CEOs who've been on these bank subs, these bank subsidiaries have got the idea that, hey, if it's okay for a bank, why isn't it okay for a credit union? And they pushed to change the legislation so that they could get on the board of their credit unions. Um, and I think the, 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 the upshot of this is that that survey result we showed you a moment ago is gonna change. We're gonna see more and more CEOs on the board of credit unions in Ontario for sure. Probably other provinces are gonna follow because there is this kind of patterning, this isomorphism in the regulatory space as well. Um, and I think this is, this is deeply concerning. So Anthony's gonna talk to you about a case now that I think you see some evidence of the, the kind of end result of all this kind of um, process of professionalization. So Anthony, I'll over, turn it over to you and I'll just move to the next slide. Perfect, thank you. So the, uh, the case I'm gonna talk about is, as Marc-Andre mentioned is the uh, demutualization of, of economical insurance. So it's an insurance company that's been in Waterloo region since uh, 1870. So it's 150 year history. And what we can see is, is the outcome of, of professionalization here is a shift in the board's thinking. And if you look at the economical board, you'll see that it is very similar to what you would expect from, from really any for-profit insurance company. And the result of this has been a primary focus of the board of, um, that we see in this outcome here of, of a business lens being put on things. Uh, and there is certainly uh, an element that the board needs to, to be considering the, the business needs of, of the, the corporation, uh, whether it's a mutual or for-profit. But what we see is, is kind of three key areas where, where the board's uh, view is, is missing the cooperative principles. Uh, the, the first is around member needs, and, and the board is really viewing the members' needs through a shareholder lens uh, and not as a holistic member that's, that's actually getting services uh, from the organization as well and has a community interest. And that would be the second piece. Uh, the community impact of demutualization has clearly not been, been fully considered here. Uh, and the last piece I would suggest is that uh, co-op values were, were not at the forefront of this demutualization decision. And, and I believe that that goes back to the professionalization. Uh, the, the board has, has published their, their six reasons for demutualization as part of their uh, perspective documents that was shared with the, uh, the membership. Um, and we can walk through those and, and each of those six, and I'll do that briefly, highlights where the, the board's thinking um, has shifted towards a, a business lens and not a, a cooperative values lens. So the first around preparing for industry consolidation, uh, the focus here is very much on economical's ability to, to acquire other companies, um, which is something that mutual insurance companies, and they have done it in the past, have, have managed to, to partner together. So it's not acquiring, but it is still uh, consolidating um, as there may be some need to, to, to grow, to, to compete. Um, but this um, preparation for consolidation doesn't consider the reality that um, once you become a for-profit company, not only can you buy up other companies, but you can also now be bought out. Uh, and the history here in Waterloo Region can, can point back to uh, Mutual Life's demutualization, which, which quickly led to, the, to that company uh, being purchased and, and the ending of, of that, that mutual insurance company. The, the second piece around improved uh, company stability, um, this is, is fairly focused on um, some, some details around, around capital market access. And uh, the interesting thing there that I would suggest is a company that's been around 150 years uh, needs to do a little more 
uh, to suggest that there, there's some instability than, than just suggesting that access to, to, to capital markets will, will shore up their stability. What this really means uh, here is that uh, the company can't grow as fast uh, if they are remain as, as a mutual insurance company. Um, but I would argue that uh, that that slowed growth may may be a, an inhibitor um, in terms of you know being bigger, but it's not necessarily an inhibitor in terms of stability as as the company uh, argues. The, uh, the the third piece is um, they, they argue um, for the ability to create a holding company, which is uh, a complex sort of issue here. Um, one of the things they do note is that uh, there is some potential that if they lobbied, they would be able to do this as a as a mutual. Uh, but the, the big flaw here is this holding company piece is, is really about uh, buying up other companies. So it comes back to that preparation for, for, for consolidation. But they don't argue here that there's, uh, there's benefits for the members uh, by creating a holding company. They, they don't even outline here, you know, why is the ability to hold some companies that aren't insurance companies of benefit to the members of improved services? Uh, this isn't even thought of, uh, but this does argue in this section that the company could be be more profitable, which comes back to that idea that uh, they're largely only considering the membership as, as shareholders and not as as members. Uh, the, the fourth one is is frankly laughable. Uh, increased transparency um, by becoming a for profit company. At no point do they acknowledge that um, the requirements of a for profit company trading on a stock exchange could instantly be put into their their bylaws and could be adhered to right now. Um, and they could even, uh, in this case, practice a different transparency. Um, so my side research uh, that I'm going to talk about tomorrow looks at uh, engagement with members uh, by the boards of, of co-ops and, and other nonprofits. And this is an area where uh, Economical could actually be a leader and they could go beyond what the um, regulators are requiring for stock traded companies and do some things that are really transparent with their with their membership. Um, so there is nothing stopping them from practicing these these transparencies. Um, and I would suggest that once it was in the bylaws, it would be relatively difficult uh, once the membership got used to some of this transparency for it ever to actually be rolled back. The, the next one is um, improved employer attraction and retention. And this is uh, is really focused on the senior executive ranks. Uh, and it's suggestions that they can design compensation packages that uh, are related to um, to stock value, essentially. Um, this ignores uh, two things. So the first thing it ignores is that it is already possible to um, design quasi metrics, and it's debatable how effective they are, that, that would mimic uh, stockholder value using some some other calculations for uh, for mutuals and for uh, credit unions. Uh, but the, the other piece that's kind of ignored here is um, the idea that being a mutual could actually be a differentiator that is attractive. And at first I thought this was sort of a, a theoretical idea that, uh, that I was playing around with. Uh, but just last week I saw that Libro Credit Union actually had an ad on, on Twitter. I jumped out at me and the, the first line is, ever wonder what it's like to work for a purpose-driven financial institution? And I immediately thought to Economical and said, you know, they could use this exact same tagline and they would be um, pitching to, to values. But this isn't something that was uh, was talked about at all in, in the perspective and, and I've never seen uh, an ad from, from economical in that way. So they, they seem to be missing the, the other side of this. And then the, the last piece, and, and I would suggest this is the, the main driver for, for this uh, decision is unlocking financial value for, for the policyholders. Um, they, they've, economical has this unique structure that is facilitated and it's clearly been a, a long running goal for the uh, leadership of the organization to to demutualize uh, and they've actually got a dual class structure so they have uh, approximately 800 mutual policyholder members and then the rest of the membership over 50,000 is um, non mutual members so they are are not actually members but they are policyholders and they've created this unique dual structure uh, in such a way that those mutual members um, are going to generate um, somewhere of a financial benefit between 200 and uh, a half million dollars, depending on, on what the IPO uh, goes for. Whereas the other um, non-member policyholders will be generating a return um, approximately, you know, two to five thousand um, dollars. So there is, is clearly a, a very large financial incentive. Uh, now, one of the pieces they have included is a hundred million dollar um, to be set aside, to be put into a, a charitable foundation. Now, what's what's interesting there is um, if you were to look at what the actual indivisible reserve would be, it would be probably closer to to a billion dollars. 
And nowhere in this um, unlocking financial value for policyholders do they actually consider um, the argument of an indivisible reserve, or, or even do they engage with this idea that there was a legacy of 150 years of this organization, and the, the value that sits here right now um, was, was generated uh, over that 150 years, and there are literally um, some past members of the organization that are now dead who helped generate this, this value right now. If this was a publicly traded company, um, that value would, would um, go and flow to, to their heirs. But because of the mutual structure, that's created this unique circumstance where those members who are members right now can, can benefit disproportionately financially for the, the history of the organization. Um, so they, they, they seem to acknowledge that with this, this $100 million charity foundation, but at no point do they, they talk about what I would argue should be the, the crux of the entire debate. Um, what if we created a billion dollar foundation would we actually be doing more for our community? Would we be doing more for our mutual structure to demutualize and maybe say, you know, there are other places people can get insurance. When we first created this, property insurance was a major problem that we needed to address for our members. So to me, if I was bringing this from a mutual cooperative values perspective, the debate would be around taking the indivisible reserve and doing something different in the community with it while acknowledging that we've largely solved the, the reason for our existence. That debate was not talked about in, in the outline at all, and I would suggest it's because there was a primary business lens that looked at this and said, uh, we have a large financial value that we can give to a one-time payment for our members, and um, the organization's interest is, is not necessarily paramount here. So with, with that, I'll close. Hopefully, uh, we can talk a little more about that or perhaps a discussion, and I'll flip it over to uh, Mark Andre again, who will then transition to Diane. Uh, okay. Dion. Yeah, I'm going to pass it to uh, right the puck right to Dion so she can get going. Dion, over to you. Okay, excellent. So uh, to put some of the practical discussion um, that uh, Mark Andre and Anthony have been talking about so far into a more generalizable framework, I'm going to present a, a governance framework that's come out of a lot of work with um, colleagues at the Center for the Study of Cooperatives at the University of Saskatchewan over the years. And this framework really focuses on what we see as the three major problems or challenges of governance. And as a result, they're what we see as the primary responsibility of co-op board members. Um, and I'm going to very briefly describe the framework and then apply it to analyze the pros and cons um, of professionalization of co-op boards um, and how co-op boards might need to think about applying this framework in their context. So what are these um, three key challenges of governance? Well, the first is managing strategic interdependencies. And in the language of economics, um, this is all about solving cooperation and coordination problems, um, or in another, put another way, uh, for a co-op to thrive or even for it to survive as a co-op, everyone in the co-op needs to perform their roles. So members need to continue to patronize the co-op, um, directors have to provide good strategic guidance, managers have to have the expertise to run the organization, and the staff of the co-op needs to work productively, efficiently, and effectively. And good governance in managing strategic interdependencies makes sure that it gives all key stakeholders the sense of pride and ownership in belonging to and supporting the co-op, but it also ensures incentive, incentives and rewards are al aligned and structured in a way that doesn't undermine the individual behaviors needed for mutual success, and preferably tries to fully align all the behaviors of all the stakeholders. Um, the second governance challenge is for the co-op to establish and maintain legitimacy in the eyes of key stakeholders, which includes the members for sure as one of the key stakeholders um, and most important stakeholder, but also other stakeholders like employees and government regulators. And without legitimacy, policies of the co-op might be ignored, incentives might be viewed differently by different stakeholders um, when they're brought, put down from the board or management. It might be difficult for the co-op to access resources, some information could be distorted or not provided at all, and some views might even be completely disregarded when they come from certain um, stakeholders. The third challenge of governance is developing the right view of the future to adapt and respond to changing and uncertain environments. And um, all organizations actually exist not only to coordinate action uh, of individuals, but also to help individuals deal with uncertain environments. And so decisions about investments, production, employment, growth um, in the future for a co-op, um, and even marketing plans, um, how, how you're gonna market your co-op and, and its value proposition require views about what the future will bring. And part of this um, responsibility of the board falls under risk management for sure. 
um, which is something we're very familiar with, but uncertain environments are when it's really difficult to even assign probabilities to the likelihood of a particular scenario or outcome occurring. And in complex systems, um, in environments that are changing rapidly, uncertainty is more often the environment we're dealing with. Um, and so every individual and group within the co-op has its own filters, cognitive frames, or ways of thinking. Um, and governance really determines whose voice counts and which view of the future will actually guide the co-op. And I think some of the framing and language that Anthony was talking about, um, depending on who's using that, um, those, those same, that same language, they might do two different types of approaches. Um, and so I think, um, it, it, in other words, thinking about it from this perspective, who gets to decide what and how will affect what views and ultimately what strategies are accepted, and also, also how easily and accurately these views can be adapted to future changing circumstances. So just that's a brief overview of the framework. There's a lot more to it, um, but I'm just going to use that to apply this framework to analyze the professionalization of co-op boards. And I think that when you use this framework, you can actually think about both pros and cons of professionalization of co-op boards. I think on this panel, we're kind of moving um, in the direction of making a, a thesis statement that the professionalization as it's currently considered is not is not maybe the best approach, but you can think about some pros and cons when you apply this framework. So some pros is that um, it, it can outside experts can facilitate important outside connections for the co-op to other communities, to other resources, to other knowledge. They can sometimes see problems with current incentive structures from an outside objective perspective. And they can also provide missing expertise that, that co-ops really do need in order to in order to survive and thrive. Um, experts can also provide greater legitimacy. As Marc-Andre said, the regulators are expecting there to be some professional expertise on these boards. And so this is really important in certain sectors like banking, uh, for instance. Outside experts can also bring different ideas from outside the system that facilitate adaptation in dynamic environments. Um, I've been part of co-ops in the past that maybe we're in a, a state of stasis or stagnation, um, not sort of recognizing some of the challenges that might be coming in the future. And so I think experts can sometimes come in to kind of disrupt a bit of that stasis and provide an all offer alternative views of the future. So that said, there's also a lot of cons of, of professional experts on the boards. Um, unelected experts might not understand the strategic interdependencies that are required for a cooperative system to actually operate. So the importance of members um, in the co-op, the connections among cooperatives, for instance, in federations, understanding how critical cooperation among co-ops is for survival uh, of, of the system. These are all important components of strategic interdependencies that are different in co-ops. Um, experts um, might not be accountable to the stakeholders that the co-op really needs to be accountable to. So an unelected professional expert it may be more likely to be accountable to their own profession or some outside body or regulator and, and not kind of consider what, um, what their accountabilities are to the members of, of the board of the co-op that they're sitting on. And in responding to uncertainty, no one has a perfect idea of the future, and there can sometimes be too much deference to experts, and experts have biases as well, and these biases can be incredibly problematic in conditions of uncertainty. So there was a re research a few years ago by um, a colleague of mine at the University of Toronto at Rotman, um, Tilsik, and, and uh, his colleague Almanaz on governance of community banks in the United States. And they found in their analysis that boards with a high proportion of domain experts generally performed, didn't perform any better or worse than boards with few experts. But when facing un situations of uncertainty, expert heavy boards are actually more likely to hurt the chances of an organization to survive. And this is because of overconfidence of experts, cognitive entrenchment of experts, and there's too little task conflict um, or lack of offering alternative viewpoints because of this deference to experts. And so that's a, these are important problems in terms of coming up with a, a good view of the future. And I think I'll just end um, before turning it back to Mark Andre to wrap up is to say that the reason we focus on the challenges of governance in our governance framework is because the way that any co-op board responds to these challenges requires a really deep understanding of the particular environment in which that co-op is operating. And so their responses have to be uh, and should be context dependent. Um, and I think while there are better and worse ways for boards to respond to these challenges, um, 
we're a bit skeptical that there are ever truly best practices that can be developed for all co-op boards in all times and places. And in fact, most best practices for governance that have been developed have been a result of understanding governance failures in investor-owned firms rather than governance failures in cooperatives. And I think that policymakers, to Mark Andre's points about regulatory uh, or policy isomorphism, is they are often regulating about what they think are the best practices, and those can be um, damaging for co-ops. So I'll turn it back to Mark Andre to wrap up. Great, thank you, Zion. So I think I, I'm going to kind of do this very quickly because we're running low on time. But I think I want to zoom out a little bit and suggest that this trend professionalization, both emerging from within the sector and perhaps being imposed a little bit from outside the sector, even those pros that Dion talked about, those pros of professionalization, I think are, are flowing from this kind of almost, I, I've been calling it the anti-reformation anti kind of tendencies in our society, this kind of suspicion of democratic structures. Um, and I think this is something that, especially in the cooperative sector, of course, and I think everyone would agree this, we have to be very mindful of. If we look at the Rochdale pioneers, these were people, and Brett Fairburn has talked a lot about this in his work on the history of Rochdale, has talked a lot about this, that these folks were doing something quite radical, asserting their capacity to manage their own affairs, right, in a, in a context where they were seen as incapable of doing that. And I think that same logic is playing out again today as part of this kind of, let's say, digital revolution. This was the industrial revolution. There's this kind of deference to expertise that I think we have to be a little bit suspicious of, and especially if it's coming from uh, regulators. So I think that was one main point. Also, maybe another kind of more theoretical point is we have to think about democracy as ideology. I love this quote from John Dewey. It um, came up on, on, on somebody I follow closely on the internet. Um, the, really, the threat to our democracy is not the existence of foreign states or foreign totalitarian state. It's actually within us, within us and how we choose to make decisions. Um, are we going to do it through these methods of consultation, persuasion, negotiation, etc.? Or are we going to kind of defer to experts um, who have this kind of privileged view, we think, somehow, of what's coming next? Um, and so our framework really underlines the kind of fallacy of that thinking. And that's that's what I love about it and, and its application um, for these kinds of things. Um, now, I, I do have another slide that I'm going to stop and not actually talk through, but there's some pragmatic takeaways too. Uh, that I want to leave on the board and we can talk about in the question and discussion period if there's time. So thank you very much. Uh, Sheldon, over to you. And I'll stop the share, maybe. Thank you, everyone. So yes, Sheldon, we can transition to your wise words for the next five minutes, and then we'll have some time for uh, questions and answers or comments from others in the audience. I've seen the chat be very sort of a uh, lots going on over there. So th those that just presented might want to catch up too. So Sheldon, over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Karen, and thanks to the panel. I mean, I think that I see the move to professionalization of boards is really being kicked off by the financial collapse and, and Enron and, and governments making knee-jerk reactions to try and regulate uh, with a heavy-handed approach that didn't really account for all of the uh, different sectors. Um, you know, I think we, we heard about the how the application of bank policy to credit unions not necessarily that applicable. Um, and so after Enron and financial collapse are seen as a failure of governance and, uh, and they put in new governance moved and, and they want more experts on, on boards. And I think that's going to be the answer because the answer was there weren't enough experts on the board without any recognition of the, of the co-op governance. Uh, I mean, they talk about who you can appoint, ignoring the fact that, uh, you know, most cooperatives are democratically elected. Um, and, and we have lay boards. Uh, Federated Co-op has, uh, has a 15-person lay board. Um, I was at a governance conference where uh, uh, David Beatty from uh, Rotman School of Business said a couple of years ago, he pronounced the day of the laid board members are over. Uh, and I say not so fast. And I don't know how you square that uh, view of lay boards uh, with the move in modern governance to having boards be strategic rather than operational. I think if you're a strategic board and not an operational board, you're not in there uh, going line by line through the financial statements. You're, you, you should be up at the 10,000 foot level, far more, which makes it more uh, effective for, for lay boards. Uh, Enron, by the way, had the gold standard of boards. If you looked at their skills matrix, they had every, everything covered and they still took it down. Uh, so the experts are no, no assurance of anything being good uh, or better. Um, and, and even if you have an expert on your board, they're going to spend between 50 and 100 hours a year looking at uh, your work, whereas the people on the senior leadership team are probably spending 2,000 and, and upward hours a year. So I don't know how, how you can come in with 50 or 100 hours and, and do anything that uh, um, uh, 
epic. Um, but I mean, if you start talking about experts, I mean, FCL is, we're a conglomerate and there's, uh, we're very large. And so if I started saying, okay, we need uh, experts to come in and help govern federated cooperatives. So we need refinery, crude oil, uh, petroleum distribution, livestock feed, fertilizer, crop supplies, energy, distribution, logistics, warehousing, home building supplies, finance, accounting, marketing, HR. Where, where do you stop? Where do you bring the experts in? And experts in IT is going to come in and fight with your VP of IT. But again, modern governance is saying, well, we have to have an expert. You shall have uh, an IT expert on your board. You shall have somebody, uh, a finance expert on your board. Um, you know, I mean, I think some finance knowledge is good. But what we've seen is the professionalization of, um, of boards a lot through the, uh, the need that was created to create professional board members. So you had the rise of the uh, ICD, the Institute of Corporate Directors, who for $18,000, you can get training and it's, it's great training, but they don't understand co-ops. And it was made very clear to me uh, when we got a membership because a number of our directors have taken the training. And again, it's, it's good as far as it goes, but it doesn't teach co-op uh, governance or co-op uh, uh, education. And uh, it was brought home to me when I got a call from the, uh, the person from ICD to talk to, you, talk to us and welcome us to the organization. Says, so what, what are you? And we said, we're a cooperative. She goes, what's that? And I said, well, it's a, uh, you, should, you should maybe learn. Um, but I said, she said, are you a nonprofit? And I mean, that's, uh, that's uh, fighting words to, to us uh, when anybody thinks that you equate us to a, to a nonprofit. We're certainly not that. And they had a whole list of about uh, 10 or 15 different categories. And they said, which one do you fall in? And we were miscellaneous. Uh, they just had no clue. Um, but uh, but I mean, a lot of people are going out and they're getting the training for their $18,000, looking for opportunities to get on boards and get experience because they want to be board members and make some money. And they see co-ops as an easy end because there's uh, elections. And they can put their name out there and on some of these co-ops without having really any bona fides in the co-op uh, realm necessarily. And so I think the key uh, competency, if anybody in a co-op is going to be designing some sort of skills matrix for the board members, the key competency you should have is a knowledge and a fundamental understanding of, of cooperatives and a belief in the values. Because when you get a, if you get a board chair or a CEO that doesn't understand co-ops, uh, it's over. Um, and we're seeing that. Uh, we had a CEO that said, I don't get the co-op. It doesn't do anything for me. And they also don't understand life in a federation then. And so one of the challenges for us getting larger co-ops in our system is when they get larger and bigger and professionalized boards, they go to the big consultants, the big consultants go to the market and they bring in CEOs that have no sniff about uh, what a co-op is. And they see this equity and they want it um, and they want to get it out. And uh, so that, that's a real, a real danger uh, to our system. But uh, uh, I think it's just a, a lot of things that come together and we need to push back and make sure governance and regulators, a tall task, understand the differences for us. So it's a bit of a challenge. So with that, I'll uh, turn it back to uh, Karen. Thank you, Sheldon. You took some words out of my mouth. So I'm glad that you said the summary comments you did hitting on some key pieces. I mean, I think something that as I was listening to Marc-Andre start and bring up the Oxford Dictionary, I was quickly Googling, what's the antonym of professional? And, uh, you know, coming up with the words that, so if we aren't professional and we need to professional, professionalize, it does mean that currently our boards are amateur, incompetent, and inept. So we should just kind of keep that in mind. But I don't think that's true. And I very much... Uh, feel this conversation could have taken one day and not uh, 45 minutes in terms of just really unpacking the necessity for professionalization, having the word co-op in front. And I'd hope that uh, I was gonna call on Claude André Guillot to give an example, because I know he has a recent one of a, you know, a co-op being asked to bring on two outside professionals, but that ended up being a co-op lawyer and a co-op accountant. So it, it isn't about requiring that those outside folks are, uh, inept themselves in terms of their knowledge of co-ops or their values match as you sort of summed up, Sheldon. So we have uh, 10 minutes, which is probably a record amount of time for any comments or questions from uh, people that probably would like to say a lot about this as well. So because the chat has been fast and furious, whoever puts their hand up first can say something. Oh, Alexandra, I see your head's already up. You knew I was gonna say that, so go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is a subject I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about and I, and I spoke about yesterday morning uh, at the launch session. 
uh, fundamentally what's going on with the regulators is that they are indulging in magical thinking. They can't crack the problem of how to exert effective control over regulated entities so that they don't run off and take undue risks and uh, not just bring themselves down, that, that's one problem, but bring down the financial system. This is, this is what they're faced with. And I feel sympathy for uh, regulators, but they're dreaming. They're dreaming if they think that, that boards of directors are the, are the defense. <laughs> don't get me wrong here. Believe me, boards have a, have a place in cooperatives and other businesses uh, just as well. It just, just isn't the place that the regulators think it is. And even while I was arguing yesterday that you can't draw a firm line between uh, governance and management, I wasn't suggesting for a moment that it's the board's job to manage uh, the cooperative. No, it isn't. Um, you put it extremely well, Sheldon. You know, think about your own organization. Your big cooperative has, has probably dozens of vice presidents. Every one of those people is, is an expert uh, with a particular um, area of responsibility in the organization. You can't replicate that on the board. It's just, it's just nonsense. And why would you try? Uh, you would just have a conflict between, okay, oh, wait a second, who's, who's, who's driving this, uh, this car? You know, is it, is, is it the board or is it, or is it management? It has to be management. And this is what, this is what boards live with. This is what we suffer under, uh, you know, or, there's only one answer to the question, which is you've got to hire the right people to run the darn company whether it's a co-op or anything else. And then when you work at that you've got the wrong person, you have to have the courage to take them out. And being an accountant isn't going to give you any more courage than being a, a lay person. Um, one reason I, I speak passionately about this is because I'm a lay person. Um, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an accountant. I'm extremely financially uh, literate, you know, nonetheless, I can absolutely play my part. On a, on a board, but I don't seek to do what the professionals who work for us uh, do. So I don't know where this is going to end because the regulators are on a tear and they're still running and they're running where everybody this morning has said they're running. And this could have some extremely, uh, extremely unhappy uh, consequences. I'll call it collateral damage for cooperatives. Thanks. Thanks, Alexander. Uh, Marc-Andre, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I mean, of course, I agree with everything that Alexander just said, but I, I would underline, too, that I think some of this is being done by the cooperatives themselves. I mean, I think I know second tier organizations where CEOs are the dominant force. There's maybe one or two lay person on the board. And what happens is those second tier organizations become creatures of those CEOs, not of the system. They stop thinking of the system. They start thinking very narrowly. And this threatens the whole as well, just as much as the regulator imposing um, silly ideas. So I, I think we have to be also looking inside to address some real conceptual issues. Cool. Uh, I was hoping to just move on to other questions, just so we can get a few other thoughts from the audience in, but and then we can bounce around. We have one person from Dion, Anthony, Mark andre whoever waves first. There was one in the chat that's been brought up just a couple of times uh, from Olive McCarthy. And, you know, again, I know this varies from country to country, but it, it had asked to what extent are credit union directors remunerated and what impact does that have on recruitment of directors, professionalization of the board. Of course, in Canada, we know that we're allowed to, you know, remunerate directors of credit unions. Where in the U.S., it's not the same, depending if you're federal or state. So, Mark Andre or whomever, but I know you have a lot of credit union uh, experience. Does someone want to give a quick response to your views on that connection to professionalization and remuneration? Uh, if the honor Anthony wants to jump in, Anthony's on a board, so maybe Anthony might be could offer some thoughts. Or... Yeah, so credit union directors are, are remunerated, and, and I would say the remuneration is quite generous, quite fair. Um, and part of the rationale for that is there there is a desire to to have on credit union boards lawyers and accountants, and in order to ensure that that's um, that somebody's going to give that kind of time, the the re remuneration needs to be enough to to compensate for that. Yes, and Olive, if you have more thoughts on that, just perhaps we can do a little side chat because I would say, you know, the Canadian example, uh, you say it's fair, Anthony, but it depends what credit union you're on. <laughs> There's some that uh, don't pay at all still and then up to probably what's quite excessive and yep. not really necessary. But and where in the US, you could have the same size differential and be, be a volunteer completely. So as we're rounding up to five more minutes before you guys are going to get a five minute break. How do you feel about that? Uh, Jerome, your hands up. So go ahead, uh, comment or question. 
And if you have someone you want to direct it to, please say. Well, I, I would just pick up to the last comment that uh, Mark Andre made about actually looking inside uh, the cooperatives. So um, I, I'm researching cooperatives myself and uh, am in touch with uh, lots of different ones. Um, and uh, I was talking with some members, disgruntled members of a consumer cooperative in um, uh, Ithaca, New York, actually. And um, I heard a lot of the statements that I've heard in the uh, presentations and the discussion here today. And I, I would just like uh, maybe a response from some of the panelists uh, on. Um, so so their, their complaints were particularly that uh, there, there seems to be this, uh, I, I put it in the chat, this vicious cycle of professionalization. So uh, the management, particularly in this co-op, decided you know, to, to, to engage in some rationalization activities and uh, basically uh, some aggressive tactics towards the workers and so on, so forth, don't go into the details. But um, in response to, to that, the members sort of became more and more disengaged and volunteered less and less and fought at other, other you know, options. And so the revenues were falling. And uh, so in response to this, there was more professionalization that was then suggested. And so I would just like to he hear your, your response to this notion of a vicious cycle where you know professionalization is then uh, suggested as a as a uh, solution to the problems that result from professionalization thanks Jerome. dion well i just think mark andre ended on his takeaways with like the idea of do no harm and i think sometimes the the proposed cure is worse than than the disease and i think that that's something that we have to keep in mind and i think trying to um, understand how professionalization might be contributing to these problems to begin with would avoid continuing to recommend it. I will also say that I think one of the things we also have to seriously talk about is um, it's not just important that the board has co-op competencies or values. I think it is really critical that senior leadership in especially large organizations have deep co-op values and roots. I think especially important when you have really tricky and contentious issues. Sheldon's on the call, I, it's not a secret, federated cooperatives and the cooperative retailing system have had many major strikes and lockouts over the last couple of years that were really contentious. I think one of the things that um, you know, is important um, is is that the, mo many of the senior leaders in in these organizations, not all of them, in in the co-ops in, in Western Canada, but at Federated, I know there are many people there who are deep roots in the co-op system and are thinking about these issues from the perspective of co-op values and members. And I think that that's important when there are these tense issues about that have to kind of be resolved in ways that don't make everybody happy. Um, and I think people have been talking about sociocracy a lot and like maybe how some of these systems aren't really the best for, for co-ops. I'm a little more skeptical that large complex systems like the cooperative retailing system could be run very well with sociocracy, but it's possible that that could be something that we could talk about moving forward. But I think it's just really important that you have senior leaders that do understand co-op values as well, not just people on the board, but like CEOs and senior uh, VPs. Thank you, Dion. That's perfect. Uh, as we have less than one minute left, I'm just going to offer Sheldon, do you want to say the final word to close off this session uh, on the spot? Oh, no, th thanks. Uh, it's uh, it's very very exciting stuff. I mean, it's uh, you know we're we're in the midst of a lawsuit by uh, uh, Calgary Co-op right now uh, with lawyers that don't understand co-ops and uh, arguments that aren't about co-ops. And our 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 task is going to be to educate a judge at some point about co-ops. Uh, so it is very real consequences. And uh, you know we talked about mountain equipment co-op. I mean Calgary Co-op. You know from my standpoint is on the view on the road to the to being that next. Uh, that next uh, co-op uh, that uh, demutualizes. So it, it's very real consequences of stuff, and we've got to we've got to keep at it. And uh, and the ICD of the world, they train these people. They come on the boards. They bring the professionalization I ideals uh, to those boards. And and so we're working against it through educating and providing our own education to co-op directors. So fighting the fight. Fight the good fight. Thank you, Sheldon, Dion, Anthony, and Mark Andre so much for that session.